Hi, I'm Dr. Ross Carter. Today we're going to talk about stem cells and exosomes. We're going to first start by talking about stem cell functions. There are two primary effects at what exosomes are and how they work and their differences. Uh, first, we're going to start with some stem cell basics so that everyone is on the same page. Stem cells, or commonly called mesenchymal stem cells, were named by Arnold Kaplan about 30 years ago. In his lab, he was able to show that MFCs were able to form numerous types of tissue, whether it be bone, ligament, muscle, cartilage, or other tissue. Now, because of these amazing abilities, which was performed external to a body, a false theory was created or taught to many scientists and doctors that when you inject MSCs into someone's body, they would implant or engraft and form this new tissue. Unfortunately, that was later to found out to be incorrect. And what happens in the lab is not exactly what happens in real life or in your body, uh, which there has been many studies that prove. Now, the true mechanism of the action of MSCs is from their signaling ability. In fact, many scientists want to change the name of mesenchymal stem cells to medicinal signaling cells because of the signaling effect that they have. Now, this signaling effect influences the cells in a local area, something called paracrine effect. Now, as you can see on the right on this diagram, MSCs work by number one, creating a regenerative microenvironment by stimulating the body's own resident stem cells, which live throughout the tissue of our bodies. It does this in four primary ways. Number one, it prevents cell death, which is called apoptosis. Number two, it helps to prevent scar tissue formation. Number three, it stimulates blood vessel formation, which is called angiogenesis. And four, it stimulates cell division called mitosis. The second primary effect of MFCs is to do something with expression of the immune system called immunomodulation, as seen in the diagram on the left. This modulation of our immune system is how MFCs have either, they can either stimulate or minimize an inflammatory response. This is how stem cells help with systemic inflammation and all other autoimmune conditions. Now keep in mind, it is that the signals and it's not the cells themselves that cause this therapeutic effect. So the question becomes, do we even need actual live cells at all? To then answer that, let me give you an analogy. In this example, bees represent stem cells and the signaling factors from those stem cells are the honey. So let's say you like to sweeten your coffee with honey. So how do you get well, you could go to a bee farm and you could open up one of the habitats and move the bees out of the way and scrape some of the honey from the honeycomb. And then you could add that to your coffee. Now you might have some, now you'll have some sweet coffee with maybe a few bee stings, or you could simply go to a store that sells honey without the bees. You know, both get the job done, but clearly one has fewer side effects. Now let's discuss how stem cells communicate using signaling factors more closely. Cells are used an extremely small vesicle to transport the chemical signals. Now these vesicles are called extracellular vesicles and they transfer content from one cell to another. There are two kinds of extracellular vesicles. One's called microvesicles and the other one is called an exosome. Now exosomes is the smaller of the two vesicles and it measures in the range of 40 to 150 nanometers and they have a lipid membrane packet. Now, these exosomes or microvesicles are not exclusive to stem cells. They're actually released by pretty much all the cells throughout the body, but they contain vastly different cargo and information. It is this cargo that influences the cell's behavior. This information includes three primary things. Number one, you have your messenger RNA. Now, the messenger RNA is really the blueprints for the protein creation. Number two is something called microRNA. MicroRNA is involved in gene expression changes. It's also called epigenetics. And three are your proteins, including growth factors and cytokines. But unlike MFCs, exosomes do not contain DNA or other cell organelles like your mitochondria or endoplasmic reticulum or a nucleus that could cause a rejection that's commonly seen in MSC transplantation. What are the main differences between an MFC and an exosome? 
Similarly to stem cells, exosomes can home to the area of injury and the inflammation and deliver their contents. But unlike stem cells, exosomes demonstrate a number of advantages distinct from their parent cells. Number one, they can travel systemically without the risk of clumping, as seen with uh, some IVs of MSCs. Number two, most stem cells become trapped in the lungs. It's called first pass effect, which dramatically decreases their benefits. Since exosomes are much smaller particles, this doesn't happen. Number three, exosomes can cross the blood brain barrier easily without the use of mannitol, which is a sugar that's commonly used to open up the blood brain barrier. Number four, while MSCs from placenta or umbilical cord are considered immunoevasive, they are not immunoprivileged and will be perceived as a foreign cell by the innate and adaptive immune system, and they're going to be eliminated fairly quickly. Now, exosomes are able to evade the immune system response for a much longer period, extending their therapeutic value. Number five, since exosomes do not contain DNA, uh, they have no risk of malignant cell transformation. Now let's talk about how exosomes affect inflammation and autoimmune conditions. Many of the immunomodulatory effects of exosomes are related to the influences upon phenotypical expression of certain cells. For example, M1 macrophages are pro-inflammatory and secrete inflammatory cytokines, where M2 macrophages secrete anti-inflammatory cytokines. Now, MFC exosomes have been shown to influence the conversion of inflammatory macrophages into an anti-inflammatory macrophage. Similarly, T cells are divided into typically three groups. We've got your T1 helper cells, which are super inflammatory. You've got your T2 helper cells, which are not so inflammatory. And then you have your T regular cells or T reg cells, which are anti-inflammatory. Now, exosomes also can convert the inflammatory T cells into an anti-inflammatory T cells. Additionally, exosomes can stimulate the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, TGF-beta-3, TIMP, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-1. All of these actions provide the immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects that these exosomes can have. Thank you for listening. I hope that was helpful.